if there's two components uh, you shouldn't cheap out on, it would be tyres and your chain. Now the chain is working like a really like a bat out of hell, and the lubricant has a really tough challenge trying to remain, you know, just a lubricant and not becoming abrasive. If you've spent, you know, thirty dollars more on your bottle of lubricant and it's just saved you five hundred dollars, you know, it's that's a really great return on your uh, spend. Hey everyone, while in Australia, Alex caught up again with Adam from Zero Friction Cycling for a deep dive chat about chains and how to make your components last longer to save you money. Now in the past, we've edited videos like this down, but we just felt there was so much useful information throughout this conversation that we've decided to keep it all and present it as more of a podcast style vibe. So strap yourselves in, enjoy it, make yourselves a brew, and let us know your thoughts down below. Right, Adam, I really want to talk about diving deeper into the subject here of how people can go about extending the life of their chains. Because I'm not talking about speed here, we want us to be saving people money. Yes. So let's sort of start on how much difference could there be between a chain that is going to be like poorly performing because of the lubricant and the best setup out there. How much could we save in terms of money and kilometers per chain? Yeah, that's, I guess, a really big <laughs> sort of open number that I could yeah. uh, use. Uh, the short version is it can be a lot. So the, yeah, the gap between the top lubricants that we've seen uh, through the years of testing and the, the worst is quite you know, massive. So it can literally be over 10 times um, you know, quite easily. So, and when I guess you factor in the cost of you know, what the components may be on your bike, yeah. That can be hundreds to even into thousands of dollars, you know, per year or say per, you know, five to 10,000 kilometers of cycling. And, you know, that is a lot. So I, I guess an analogy I always like to try to use with people is that, you know, that everyone has, I guess, X amount of discretionary spend for this yeah. awesome hobby. And would you like to spend that on, you know, some cool new kit or upgrade a winter jacket or, you know, new glasses or shoes or proper bike fit or coaching? Or just have that burning through your drivetrain components again. Because you don't care for it properly. Just simply due to, you know, a random lubricant choice, which is, you know, maybe meh, not so great. And also mate, perhaps not knowing what you should be doing with regards to maintenance and sort of keeping on top of your chain wear. So, so what are some of the, the differences that we can talk about then in terms of the maintenance, the lubricants, and also the chains themselves. So yeah. do you want to start with the lubricants in terms of what could be extending chain life and what could be like costing you chain life? Yeah, absolutely. So what we've seen really, I mean, mostly the waxes, uh, the wax-based lubricants are dominating. Yeah. Um, so immersive waxing is pretty much always going to be key if it's a top immersive wax. Um, the, the, basically, the, the main reason is that, you know, I guess contamination in your lubricant is the key bit that obviously it causes so like dirt to, to and wear. grit yeah dirt and grit and so even for you know road cycling there's going to be airborne dust and that airborne dust is going to you know it's completely exposed imagine i guess and, and anyone can do this test if they're game you know remove the seals off your wheel bearings and bottom bracket bearings uh, and go and ride around for a while and then see how the bearings are feeling um you know no, don't do that <laughs> so yeah so i mean they just they simply will not remain feeling silky smooth. Yeah. They're going to have crap in them. They're going to be running rough and notchy and now they're going to be high friction and high wear. So, you know, your chain is much more exposed and it's also doing a huge amount more workload than what your bearings are. They get to sort of spin quite lazily in a, in a sealed environment. So, you know, the chain is working like a, really like a bat out of hell and the lubricant has a really tough challenge trying to remain, you know, just a lubricant and not becoming abrasive. And so, Immersive waxing, apart from the fact that a solid lubricant for a part that's operating externally is it's a, just a great starting point, uh, so it's going to have the highest contamination resistance. Mm -hmm. The fact that every time you re-wax, you're putting your chain into a bath of hundreds of mil of lubricant, and so you're flushing out whatever small amount of contamination has managed to get in yeah. and re-coating that chain with a solid super slippery coating of wax. And then really for a period of, say, you know, X hundred kilometres after that point, all the parts on the chain are really sliding on a solid, super slippery surface of wax, pretty much leaving the chain metal out of it. So you just get... So that's really, like the goal, that's what you want to Absolutely, to so you just get that really unassailable advantages of immersive waxing that really drip lubricants are just going to always struggle to match. So now I mean, immersive waxing isn't going to be for everybody. It is a lot easier than what it's often made out to be. Um, so I have a couple of videos on that to just show you how easy 
wax life uh, really is. But if immersive waxing is not um, simply practical for someone, uh, you know, for their writing or their mechanical sort of confidence and things like that, uh, we're seeing really that the wax drip lubricants are dominating overall um, from the testing. Again, it's, it's just a contamination thing. The wax-based lubricants, they set to, you know, pretty much even just a semi-solid or a, like a paste, and that simply has still a higher dust contamination resistance than a wet lubricant will. So wet lubricants just... By their nature, dust just sticky. It will stick. <laughs> yeah. And also being wet, it has it has a pathway to transport itself from outside the chain to inside the chain. Yeah. So, you know, wet lubricants to a degree are up against it. They can be really convenient for a lot of people. They're, you know, easy and, and so on and to plonk on. You don't have set times and so on like you do with wax strip lubricants, yeah. which will have a carrier. So, you know, for for some cyclists, a good wet lubricant can still be just the best option for It's them. definitely better than no care at all, isn't it? Better than no care yeah. at all. And so like a, a top wet lubricant, you know, especially if you are a road cyclist, so you're not out in the world of dirt and dust where that, you know, the nature of the wet lubricant is going to be a, a real issue. You know, a top wet lubricant for you know, road cycling can be a great option for many. So, but, you know, as a broad trend, that's kind of what we're, you know, uh, you know seeing is sort of like top, the immersive waxes pretty, uh, pretty hard to beat, then the top wax strip lubricants and then your top, uh, you know, wet lubricants. Quite popular as well these days is, I guess, what's called the, the hybrid or combo approach. So mm -hmm. there's a number of the top wax strip lubricants that are using a very refined wax base that's you know, really just the emulsified version of what the top but, immersive waxes are. Okay, yeah. So they're really <clears throat> fully compatible to use with your immersive waxing. And so starting off, say, waxed, then you just relube with that um, wax compatible drip lubricant, the next, say, five uh, relubes, and then you just Rewax the chain. So that's to trying to help, I guess, with the convenience aspect Absolutely, of it, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. So it's one of those things like it gets you, you know, it's not as good, but it gets you in a pretty good ballpark of, you know, immersive waxing all the time. Yeah. Um, but just taking the pressure off having to sort of think about like, every yeah. time I need to relube my chain, I've got to do a rewax. You can just, you know, do that, say, every fifth time, which for most people, especially if it's, say, road cycling and you're going to go around 300 kilometres um, per wax treatment. Yeah. You're only rewaxing about every say around every you know 1500 kilometers, so that it's makes pretty it pretty good, isn't it? It's pretty easy, and that, and that is normally so. If you're running a wet lubricant, um, even a, a good wet lubricant, that that can often be around about the point where you might be thinking about doing some sort of maintenance to reset, you know, flush clean out and reset that chain anyway. So just popping it off and into a pot of wax, you turn the pot from off to low, swish it when it's melted hang it to set, like it's really, it's not that uh, difficult. So if you've got room for a pot and you can turn it on to low, um, you're going to be pretty much yeah. sort of set and to it's go. Not, so. it's, like you say, it's not that difficult. And yeah. when you start to break down some of the numbers and think, well, it's like 15 minutes or whatever mm. the process, you can be quicker the more you do it. Yeah. To save yourself X amount of money over this period of time, you think it feels like a no-brainer yeah. to go, I want to save myself that amount of money just for 15 minutes every now and again. Yeah, absolutely. And so, and over the years, so I guess having been in the space for a little bit now, it's been really quite remarkable. It's been, I guess, that the trend towards immersive waxing has been a lot stronger than what I ever thought it would be. So when yeah. I started this, immersive waxing really was quite niche. Yeah. And now it is very mainstream. So it's it's you know become quite commonplace to either be sort of you know immersive waxing just as the path or the hybrid approach. Uh, and the hybrid approach really helps for a lot of off-road riders because by the nature of you just riding out in the dirt and dust, yeah. the treatment lifespans are going Much to be shorter. Harsher. It is just harsh. It's going to abrade the, the treatments off faster. So, um, you know, it's sort of keeping on top of re-waxing if you're an avid gravel or mountain bike rider can be tougher. The hybrid approach just makes that so much easier so so that's that's really sort well, of i think it. as cyclists and i think in general life we're all guilty of wanting like the convenience aspect for stuff isn't it yeah. it's just about trying to tailor that to think how can i save myself money and care for my bike as well yeah, yeah. But i think cyclists in general are slow to adopt new technologies so i think it's gradually over time people are becoming more aware of it and then prepared to maybe learn a slightly new skill or process and then build from that yeah, I think, well, the, again, the, the trend in, I guess, the focus in this space has been really positive over the last few years, and it's probably been driven by a few uh, factors. So, you know, one, price of components um, yeah. that, that, you know, once somebody gets burnt with having to replace a really expensive cassette uh, and chain and potentially chain rings, yeah, often that can drive them to look a bit deeper at what they want to do on the next one. 
Or, you know, when someone's buying their dream bike and it's got this awesome group set, you know, it's the first time they're stepping up to a higher tier group set and they want to look after that so they'll have a deeper look into it. But also Cycling Media has been doing a you know, great job over the last, really, I guess, five years of sort of covering the space better. Uh, companies that are really, you know, sort of high profile in this space, um, like, say, Silka, that communicate what they're doing and why and why it works, you know, really well, just helps drive awareness. And so all that's led to a much stronger focus overall. And so things have been trending sort of, you know, pretty well. And, yeah, that, that just means that, you know, more people are just understanding some of these uh, basics. Now. Well, that's like the main goal, isn't it? In, yeah. Improve awareness, save people money. So yeah. if we've discussed a little bit about the lubricants themselves, that's yeah. it kind of feels to me that's almost one part of the picture because there's the actual physical change. So mm. are all chains created equal? Are more expensive chains better than cheaper ones? Like, are they all built to the same tolerances? Like, how can we can we differentiate between them? And what can people do to decipher like good from bad? I suppose. Yeah. So, so I mean, as a general rule, and there is variance to this, of course. <coughs> yeah. You're going <laughs> to put it. Dip, it depends in there, aren't you? Yeah. But <laughs> it's it's this one's a sort of simpler in a way that you know, whilst there are, there's going to be, I guess, brand and model differences for sure. Yeah. Um, but as a general rule of thumb, your higher tier. Uh, chains will have some really important stuff with regards to its longevity um, as opposed to the uh, cheaper level chains. So the cheaper level chains just often, they won't have like a low friction coating mm -hmm. on them, but more crucially, they won't have the same wear resistant treatments that the higher uh, tier chains have. So you often don't need to buy the top level chain, but usually at least sort of second tier is a great place uh, to, to get. And I guess just it's one of these things, my sort of golden rule is if there's two components uh, you shouldn't cheap out on, it would be tyres and your chain. Um, because That's a good, just, good way to live your life, I think. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> because, I mean, the, the chain is just, again, it's just such a hard-working component yeah. that a budget-level chain, it is going to be a false economy uh, almost always. So, um, yeah, at least in general, that sort of second-tier level chain or above, it, it's going to be usually a good chain. So. And so do you find that... Of course, we've got this variation between different brands. Some might tend to be a bit better than others, but within their their own ranges of products, are there some which might last longer, might be a little bit faster, and how does that work? Yeah, so I, again, normally the top tier is going to be faster and yeah. longer lasting, um, and the second tier can usually be pretty close to that. For some brands, there's not that much of a step down. Um, if you sort of step down below that, the, yeah. the, the gap, you know, it's going to skimp on some things versus the higher levels, but the difference is not that stark. And for others, probably in this case, like SRAM is probably the most stark example where in say like SRAM Eagle, uh, the GX level chains don't have the hard chrome treatment uh, and SRAM's hard chrome treatment is amazing for wear life protection. So going from a GX level to an X01 level, which has the hard chrome, gives you probably at least about a 10 times greater wear life uh, over a GX level chain. So That's crazy, isn't it? That's a pretty, huge difference. Pretty mega. And GX chains are just super common because that that's, I think, probably one of their, you know, by far highest volume sort of sales chains yeah. for the Eagle group sets. And it fits but, into that sort of what seems to be like a more wallet-friendly price point, I guess, yeah. as well. Yeah, and so it's, yeah, it comes OEM on a lot of bikes and, yeah. and yet the wear rate on those chains is really quite rapid. It just doesn't seem to really have any sort of wear protection uh, much at all, especially in the harsher life of off-road. Yeah. Whereas the XO1 chain and XX1 chains are pretty much like the longest lasting chains that we've ever seen. So they have wow. amazing, like they are so hard, they can handle so much abuse of wet, muddy off-road riding and, and all sorts of stuff. So there can sometimes be a big gap, um, which is, yeah, sort of why we sort of tend to say, as a general rule of thumb, at least that second tier level of chain is going to be a great spot to be like in. strike that good balance, don't, Yeah, don't go budget on your hardest working component because it may have a much shorter lifespan than the next level up. Uh, so just to be safe, yeah, go at least that yeah. second tier. And like the chain's one piece of the puzzle, isn't it? You've got the chain rings, the cassette, and once you start adding up the cost of those components, yeah. you get to like some eye-watering amounts of money. Or Absolutely, yeah. I mean, the, the lifespan of your chain rings and your cassette are going to be very much dependent on the lifespan of your chain. And the faster mm. the chain wears, yeah. the more likely you are going to be caught out with that going past its wear tolerance mm -hmm. and starting to eat into your uh, chain rings and cassettes. So 
Uh, and I guess another point as well. So for those that um, are using drip lubricants, which mm -hmm. is going to still be you know a majority. Yeah, vast majority. A chain's wear rate is typically not linear. So um, when you have a brand new chain uh, and you know everything's all all nice and clean and, and groovy to start with, say the first couple of months of that chain's life, the lubricant is going to you know its its average say level of abrasiveness for that lubricant is going to be quite low. And yeah. It's going to be continuing up as time goes on and you just keep adding more lube and it's exposed. Um, and the chain will typically, you know, have some level of, you know, I guess coatings on there that are going to hopefully help protect it against wear. But as time goes on, those protections on the chain will be compromised and your lubricant is becoming more abrasive. So people get caught out quite easily with they might check their chain wear after, say, two or three months and it's looking really good. They check three months later and it's ripped past ah, okay. the, the 0.5. And now when they get a new chain, they need a new cassette and they've probably made some good inroads into their chain rings. So that catches people out It's like quite a false a sense of security early yeah. on. You think, this is great, it's going to last me forever. Yeah, that's right. And so, again, the longest, I guess, the harder you're wearing chains, you've got a, a bigger window that if you forget uh, some things, you're, you're more likely to still be okay. So, okay. so we discussed a bit about how different brands um, d differ as well and the lubricants, but something that is occurring to me is the, the modern trend is we're seeing manufacturers increase the number of gears and speeds that bike got. Mm. You know, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 speeds exist. Like, that's absolutely crazy. Yeah. So does that mean generally in order for manufacturers to do that, the, the kind of general gist is that they're making everything narrower. The chains become narrow to fit into the same kind of gap. So does that mean that a narrower chain, because it's then smaller, is going to wear way faster than a wider chain from, I don't know, 10, 15, 20 years ago? And how do single speed chains compare? Mm. Is there a speed of chain which seems to be the most robust? Like, what, what sort of stuff have you found? Yeah, this is a, a fun one. So. Uh, interestingly, overall, like as a broad trend, as the speeds have increased, the chains have actually become better and longer well, that's lasting. Good. That's yeah. great. So, yeah. Great. So there, there are, again, there are exceptions. So some chains, for instance, when they've gone from 11 to 12 speed, they have taken a little bit of a, a wear life hit versus what they were in 11 speed. But more, more, more often, the, the top tall speed chains are actually the longest lasting chains that we've ever seen. So oh, yeah. the Shimano XT or say M8100 level and M9100 level chains are super long lasting. The Eagle chains, the X01 uh, level and XX1 level are just extremely long lasting, similar with their force and red level for the flat top chains. I uh, haven't uh, had the chance yet with the T-type, the but I, they're using the hard chrome as well. So no doubt the top levels yeah, of T-type are going to be, yeah. So that overall trend, so there are some exceptions with some brands, but in general, as the speeds have increased, we've just seen basically better tech, better metals uh, and, and hardening treatments uh, being used. So they've trended up, which is great. And broadly, so a 12-speed chain, in most cases, uh, the internal width is actually the same as, say, a nine-speed chain. So from nine-speed through to most 12 speeds, they're actually what's called an 11 by 1 to 8 standard. So the internal width of the chain is 11 by 1 to 8 of an inch. Mm -hmm. So if you're running a single speed setup, you could run a nine speed chain or a 12 speed Eagle chain and it's exactly the same to those components. Okay. So you're not having to worry about gaps between cogs. So internally those chains are the same uh, standard. So um, the actual, I guess, surface pressure loads, so this, you know, the surface sizes haven't become more narrow. Oh, that makes sense, pressure. yeah, okay. So for some of the studying, so the uh, flat top chains are a little bit more narrow internally and the Eckhart 13 speed is more narrow internally, so that will have uh, definitely kicked up surface pressure loads. Uh, don't have data on Eckhart yet, um, but yeah, it's certainly possible that that has started to trend back to faster wearing. But yeah, broadly speaking, good news is that things have actually gone really well as speeds have increased. And especially these days, the older chains, Yeah. Um, like if you go to, say, an eight-speed chain, most of those will be very fast-wearing because they're quite cheap. It's hard to actually buy a quality eight-speed chain. Most eight-speed chains will be pretty budget, maybe 20 bucks, and you're just going to get pretty you basic. You get through more of them. <laughs> you just get basic steel pretty much. There's yeah. not really going to be the hardening treatments on that. There's, no, there's going to be no fancy chromium plating or Siltec. Uh, or other low friction uh, coatings on there. So they they would tend to wear quite quickly. And same with pretty much say your single speed, your one eighth track chains, despite looking all beefy and burly. Yeah. 
they're actually really fast wearing in general. That seems well, counterintuitive, so, doesn't yeah, it? Because yeah. you think, like you say, big, burly, you go, there's loads of material here, it must yeah. be so strong, but apparently... No, so generally they're actually pretty, I guess, comparatively quite soft um, metal compared to your higher end, um, you know, 11, 12 speed chains. And yeah, again, without any sort of hardening and wear protection, they do actually wear really quite quickly. And, and again, I mean, a lot of single speed chains, if you, and not to pick on a particular brand, but if you pay, say, $30 for an Azumi standard chain that weighs twice as much as a, you know, a high level, high tech 12 speed chain that costs you three times or five times the price, you're just flat out buying cheaper steel um, yeah. without without the uh, the fancy stuff on there. So they just yeah don't stack up at all. Rewear life to the much much more narrow chain. So in that case, it does seem like you pay more, you you're getting something back for it, which is a good mm. situation yeah. to be in, right? Yeah. But when it comes to trying to strike a balance between lubricant costs versus how much is going to extend the life of your chain, like is mm. there a, a kind of like sweet spot where we go in this? this price point for a lubricant is going to save you this much money on chains or you're going to go, well, this is so expensive, you might just be better off buying an additional chain and sucking yeah. up the fact that it's worn out. Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, um, we actually have a bunch of custom uh, run modelling. So from the testing, because the testing is wear uh, yeah. related. So during a test, we actually track, uh, obviously, how much uh, lubricant we actually use. Uh, so some lubricants you don't need to apply very much at all. Um, and some lubricants have a fairly heavy application rate. So yeah. you've got the cost of, of the lubricant and also then the lubricant usage rate. So how much of that... How quickly you can empty the bottle. <laughs> That's right, yeah. yep. And also how long does that lubricant treatment last? So um, I think we might yeah, chat earlier, but there can be... So you might spend $15 on a bottle of, you know, for 120 mil of lubricant and you have to apply five to eight mil of that every 300 kilometres. Or you could spend $50 on a 60 mil bottle of you know uh, something like silk synergetic that you only need to apply one to two mil every 500 kilometers it's actually about 50 percent cheaper just from a purely lubricant cost basis yeah. to spend 50 dollars on 60 mil as it is to spend 15 dollars on 120 mil there's a big difference isn't it pretty big difference and so not many people will uh, yet sort of factor that in but that's where we have we have in the cost of um, run modeling every part's broken down including the lubricant cost so you can actually see if you choose sort of this lubricant in the cost to run model or this lubricant, what's the actual lubricant cost? And it's like, wow, this one was $50 a bottle, but the, yeah. even the lubricant cost per 10,000 kilometres is cheaper than this one, which was 15. So that that's one start. So it can be a false economy to yeah. buy a cheap uh, product, again, on your hardest working component. Um, and, yeah, similar with, obviously, the chains. Yeah, I was uh, going to say, what happens if we start to factor the chains into this as well because they're obviously yeah. a greater expense than the lubricants. Mm. Yeah, so how much the, I guess, the the high-performing lubricant will save you as a, as a yeah. you know, the first part is to really consider the cost of your components. If you're yeah. running 10-speed Tiagra, yeah. a $50 a bottle of lubricant may not save you as much as if you're on XX SL T-type. Yeah. Um, that is going to save you yeah, that that lubricant if it's like high the performing value. Yeah, that's right. So if the expensive lubricant is genuinely a proven, tested, high performance lubricant, it will pay for itself in no time and then save you a whole ton of money over the the lifespan. How many times set. over do you think you can save in terms of the chain? Is it going to double the chain life, triple it? How how much buy? Yeah, so I guess even if we use a fairly easy example, say like a, a Durace, so uh, between the cost of the chain and a cassette. <clears throat> that's going to cost, you know, depending on where you are, say around $500. So if a lubricant, even if it only cut the wear rate in half, so you get now double the length of time out of your chaining cassette than you did before. If you've spent, you know, $30 more on your bottle of lubricant and it's just saved you $500, you yeah. know, it's that's a really great return on your uh, spend, uh, you know, th yeah. that extra cost on the lubricant. And it can be obviously a lot higher than that if the components are more expensive. If you've got a $700 Axis Red cassette yeah. uh, and a $150 chain or a $900 T-Type cassette and a $250 chain, it can save you, or that $30 investment extra on your bottle of lubricant can save you hundreds to thousands. So It's, it's a, really significant. I think it's an area that some people perhaps really aren't aware of, but I mean, I guess that's why we're sad talking about it because it's important yeah. to get this information out to people and go, look, the, this is a whole like area that you can save so much money on. Yeah. Not only that, 
if you are interested in like trying to go faster, this is an aspect that's also going to help with speed as well. Absolutely. So it's it's one of the it's, it truly is one of the best, I guess, win-win situations. So a lot of the times, say if you focus on speed, if you want something that say faster, you go for a, a time trial tire. It's going to cost you typically a lot. Yeah. Uh, I think some of the what are the the Grand Prix five thousand TTs are about one hundred and fifty bucks. Oh, a pop. Yeah, they're expensive. Yeah. And they typically won't last as long as a uh, you know sort of a the, just your more normal uh, tire that's going to you know, be for training. So you're paying more and it's lasting less. Um, you know, in, in this case, is you know you, what you're saving in your watts is saving you a lot of money as well at the same yeah, time. Yeah, that's so a good yeah. way of putting it. That. Yeah, so it is, it is a really great win-win, and a good way to think about it is like it can be very, very easy to say uh, save say three to five watts from going with a proven top lubricant versus just a random lottery option. From, yeah, who knows where? And so that's three to five watts. You know, every single pedal stroke that's going into propelling you forwards further and faster, yeah. as opposed to three to five watts, every pedal stroke literally going into eating through your chain and drive train components faster. Yeah. So, <clears throat> yeah. And I think there are lots of different products in different categories out there, which mm. perhaps maybe have similar sort of claimings of what savings and stuff, but are going to yes. cost like 10 times the price and might not necessarily live up to that and aren't going to save yeah. other components. So I think that's, it's like, it's definitely an area to focus on, isn't it? Yes, yes. Yeah, so if somebody is um, like trying to put this into a practical aspect, basically, say somebody's going, okay, I don't have time for all this immersive waxing. I'm, I don't want to do that. Does it mean they can just kiss goodbye to all of these savings? Or are there sort of maybe oil-based lubricants or more convenient ways that they can try and get this stuff? Yeah, so I guess the, the good reason um, or the good news about the top lubricants, um, be it a wet lubricant or a uh, wax-based lubricant, is that uh, the highest performing ones, the reason why you know, they're at the top of the league table in our wear correlation-based test is because they're resisting becoming you know, contaminated mm-hmm. and abrasive quite impressively. So pretty much all of the top you know, products that you'll find on the league table, they actually have pretty low maintenance compared to what a lot of other lubricants would have. Okay. So if you're, and again, especially, it's going to depend on your demographic a bit, in general, we still caution a lot about wet lubricants and off-road. Um, but if you're riding on-road, you know that top wet lubricant choice can still be a great option. And your maintenance intervals, if, especially if you're just riding in the dry, uh, they're pretty long. They're pretty easy to stay on top of. And you're, you're going to get great wear protection from those products. So you don't actually have to stress uh, too much at all. And um, you know, with, with top wax lubricants, the, yeah, the wear rates are typically outstanding. And your maintenance is pretty infrequent and pretty easy. Um, something I guess more for the the racing side to consider is that really for anyone who's a, an avid racer, considering having a dedicated race chain and training chain mm-hmm. is always a great way to go. You won't see you know um, Matthew Vanderpool or you know Tade rock up to the Tour de France on the same chain they've just hammered out the last <laughs> yeah. you know, two months training <laughs> yeah. block. So um, and for you know, really even just your recreational races. Um, a lot of recreational racers actually t- typically ride a bit and you know train a bit. So having a dedicated training chain and race chain is a bit of an easy win. Um, I mean, you're always going to need another chain sooner or later, even if you're on the great yeah. stuff, if you're riding a lot. So pre-buying that extra chain, you know, re- it doesn't cost you any more. And then when your training chain is getting near 0.5, your dedicated race chain moves over to be your next training chain and you get one new race chain or one new chain as per normal to be your next dedicated race chain. So that's just a smart way to roll for uh, avid races. Um, more tricky, I guess, maintenance situations. So if somebody's riding a lot in intrepid uh, conditions, so like it can be an awesome intrepid commuter or just, you know, yeah. the country they live in is yeah. typically pretty wet um, and they're going to be training all through winter. Uh, considering multiple chains just for your training chains is a great idea. Um, again, it's going to be a situation where it can be quite easy to get caught out with the wear rate just because the chain is really being hammered with all this stuff. Yeah. And it's a fairly, I guess, deep topic. I'll try not to ramble too much, but <laughs> basically, you know, no matter what you're running, whether you're running pretty much the best lubricant you know, that we know yeah. uh, through to random meh, there will be a performance difference. But at the end of the day, the water is going to run right through the chain because the chain's not waterproof. Yeah. And whatever crap's in the water, that's going to get pressed into your lubricant deep inside the chain. And to a fairly large extent, that's not going anywhere unless you remove it. 
So when you finish your wet ride and you come home, if you just re-lube it, which is if that's all you're going to do, then excellent because it's going to stop it from, you know, rusting. Yeah. But, you know, a lot of lubricants you're applying, say, let's call it five mil, and your chain's going to be over 100 links long. So you're putting on literally, say, 0.05 of a mil of lubricant per link on. Yeah. There's only so much flush cleaning that can do. It feels like it's going to have a minimal impact. Pretty, pretty much. Yeah. So, like, if you came back from a – or if I came back from a wet ride – Okay. And I asked you to clean my chain and I gave you 0.05 of a mil of degreaser <laughs> <laughs> to clean my chain and get it all yeah. nice for me again for my next ride. You'd probably give me some sort of meaningful look. Yeah. Um, you know, so it's very limited. You know, it's better than nothing. You're going to obviously replace the lubricant that you've lost through that harsh conditions ride. But in terms of clearing out the contamination that the water's brought in, mm -hmm. it does extremely little. So all the, all the claims with there are some lubricants out there that have detergents in them and all this sort of stuff. What you might think that that's doing from that claim, it will not be doing. Just purely on the basis of like volumes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, okay. So if you were to actually flush clean the solvent, flush clean the chain, you'd be surprised how many hundreds of mils you'd probably put through that chain before it actually came out clean. Like the first part's going to go just black. The next part's going to go black. Uh, and it's like, and you'll see all <laughs> that crap that's in there. And it's like, it, if that's from hundreds of mils, yeah. what's my 0 0.05 of a mil doing? So, you know, step one is just sort of understanding that post wet ride, really unless you do some level of intervention to reset the contamination, yeah. by and large that contamination is still going to be there and it's going to be abrading away on your lovely you know, chain and causing wear even if your next ride is in the sun. Uh, it's going to be still a bit similar to if you're you know, riding in the wet. Yeah. So, you know, it, it's just such a, you know, wet riding for a bicycle chain and it's lubricant, it really is an extreme challenge. There are not yeah. many machines that actually have that level of sort of lubrication challenge is what our humble bicycle chain does doing that type of riding. So, yeah, it's, it's just worth taking that into account and just sort of getting into the mindset of, right, what should be my plan if I'm frequently riding in such conditions to try to not have a frictional wear nightmare going on? Um, again, it's if it's your winter bike and you've got 10-speed Tiger on it, maybe you don't care and that's yeah. fine. But if it's got, you know, Axis Red on it. Yeah, um, like modern expensive components. Yeah, yeah it's worth paying it some sort of thought. It's worth having some sort of plan about what you're going to do. So if you only get caught out in the wet, you know, fairly infrequently and you just go, right, cool. I understand that it will be a great thing to do for me to reset, you know, flush clean the chain yeah. and reset the contamination, relube it, and then I'm going to be all sweet. Uh, if it's constant, then, it, you know, this is where running multiple chains really can help because of that challenge that's going on. So it can really just help that post a wet ride, you can remove that chain, pop your next chain that's ready to go on, and then just, you know, you can protect the, that chain from rusting just either by Throwing on a, on a coating, you're going to get around to doing some sort of flush clean maintenance when you can. Yeah. But just protect it from rusting and put it aside for when it's convenient for you to get to on the weekend and so on rather than trying to do it during the working week. The advantage of having multiple chains apart from making the, I guess, the maintenance uh, side easier to do at least some level um, of intervention to reset things is that you're basically guaranteeing you're going to get multiple chains through your cassette. So rather than hammering the crap out of one and yeah. getting one chain to a cassette, if you've got three chains on rotation to get you through your harsh winter, you're going to get three chains through that cassette. You're like so, spreading the wear. And you, I guess yeah. you're making sure you don't miss out on that window of opportunity when that wear rate has accelerated past. Yeah. And all of a sudden you're in this sticky situation. You go, well, the whole lot needs a place in now. That's right. So if the chain's not, you know, sort of worn past that yeah. you know, recommended mark, then you're really looking after the cassette and chain rings from wear. So rotating through those chains, just spreading those, you know, harsh riding kilometres over the chains, it just, it's basically, your chain is your most consumable part at the end of the day, or at least that's what you want it to be. Yeah. So getting three chains through a 300 or 500 or $700 cassette is a lot better than just getting one yeah. chain through. So yeah, depending on where you are in the world and what your challenge is, just ponder those sort of things. So, and again, if you're riding in such conditions, pre-buying your next two chains to run them on rotation, you know, it's... You're going to use them at some point, right. aren't you? Yeah, rather than just rip through one, then buy yeah. a new chain and then be caught out with buying a cassette right. as well. No. I think that's really good, like practical information for people to take away and not only improve their drivetrains but save themselves some money. But yeah. the final thing I want to sort of ask you about is do you think the current drivetrain setup is, has it reached peak? You know, like using a chain and the sprockets and the, the chain rings. Can we evolve this any further? How do we kind of reach the best it's going to do? And what do you think? I don't know, what do you think we're going to see in the future? Are we going to see some crazy designs or do you think this is a design that is going to stand the test of time 
like well into the future. Yeah, I really like that one. And it's always interesting to see where, I guess, various companies are playing with tech in the space. Yeah. And I'm not sure, I can't, I don't know how long the bicycle chain has been around for now, but it's a, a long, long time. time. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and it's, I guess it's really stood the test of time. And on, you know, if it's, you know, well lubricated with a top lubricant, it is an amazingly efficient uh, way to transfer the power from, you know, the chain ring what to the What are some cassette. of the peak efficiency numbers on a real optimised setup? Yeah, so the, the fastest chains are still pretty much around sort of three watt loss at 250 watt load. So that's sort of close to 99% efficient. Yeah, so you about struggle nine, to get much better than 99, do yes, you? Yes, it's about basically sort of, I like think, 98.5 from memory. So it's, it's, and the top lubricants will stay there for a pretty good period of time in, yeah. you know, most conditions. So especially for racing and so on, um, it is it is very, very efficient. So belt drives can't get close to that. Gearboxes can't get close to that. <clears throat> and, you know, even so, uh, I've been keeping a close eye on, um, you know, the, like the classified hub and so mm -hmm. on, but that still needs a chain. So yeah. there's not really anything from an efficiency standpoint um, that is going to rival uh, what's going on there. Like belt drive can be a great option again if you were an, an intrepid winter commuter. Yeah, um, I'm and, definitely and, not. <laughs> yeah, but you know, having a, having a belt drive and uh, and 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 hub um, gears like the Shimano Alfine, something like yeah. that, uh, no, that that could be a great option because you don't need to worry that yeah. the belt drive is going to be you know x watts uh, you know uh, more loss. But I don't know really of anything. So we had like, obviously ceramic speed with a driven yeah. uh, system, and so but I mean they were even for all that as awesome as that sort of project was, they were looking to save maybe around a watt on, um, you know, a three watt chain. So they're so you're getting it down to maybe a couple of watts loss yeah. as opposed to three watts loss. Yeah. So it's a very, very marginal gain. Um, and that's talking about, yeah, that efficiency number in terms of like speed. We mm. haven't even factored yeah. in anything to do with longevity there, which for no. most people is, mm. well, it mm. is or should be the most important factor unless you're out mm. trying to win the Tour de France. Absolutely. And so we had no idea really until it would be sort of real world tested, how would all those bearings hold mm. up to the real world sort of, you know, battering and use and, and the elements. So that was still a pretty big unknown as to, to how that would, would go. So I personally, I don't know really anything yet that's going to rival um, the chain efficiency. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're, I think we're going to be yeah, Stick playing in, in the space for, for a fair while uh, yet. But I think overall, though, they're in a pretty good place. You know, the electronic shifting, yeah. you know, the way the systems run, um, yeah. the general, I, I guess, trend increase in the wear longevity for a lot of the, the, the top chains and also just the focus on the chain lubrication. So we've really seen, in especially the last five years, a number of really great products come out that, you know, where the manufacturer has focused very heavily on the R&D to make a lubricant that is actually amazing for the purpose of running on a bicycle chain. It's yeah. not just a, a rebranded, you know, Industry X uh, loop. So, so all that's been been um, outstanding. There's probably, I guess, the, you know, there is a little bit of a cost concern with some of that. So yeah. we are obviously seeing the price trend with the increased speeds continue to go up. Yeah. Um, so I mean, generally speaking, a twelve piece, uh, sorry, twelve speed cassette is going to cost a good penny more than a ten piece uh, speed cassette. Yeah. Same with uh, chains, and you know, sort of seeing, especially in like, um, you know, like SRAM. I, I love you, so don't be mad. <laughs> do a lot of wonderful things, yeah. but. Um, you know, the, the price now on the T-type chains, you know. I, I think I, it's fair to say, like, the yeah. price of products is increasing what feels like disproportionately. Mm. But yeah. the good thing is, at the moment, people do still have, like, a broad choice of products. Mm. Yeah. Um, it's just, I think, it's always about finding that balance between stuff not becoming out of hand price-wise. Yeah, no, um, the concern can be that, uh, which we've sort of seen in other product categories, really, is that if a sort of brand pushes a price up, then the rest can t sort of, I guess, trend in that direction as yeah, well. Yeah, so it drags everybody up. Yeah, so I'm a little bit concerned about that. Um, but on the other side, uh, it's, it's every time there's more expensive components, it's more focused on the work that uh, we're doing at Zero Friction Cycling. So it's sort of great for <laughs> Zero Yeah, it kind of is a, it's kind of good for everybody. But yeah. like, like you mentioned, as we discussed earlier, it is good that, the more like the newest latest products and tech is evolving and not only getting faster but the longevity is increasing in many situations which is a good step forward because it would be you know it would feel incredibly detrimental to go okay this is great we've now got 
12, 13, 14 gears, but now yeah. the chain's lasting half as long. That, yeah. Surely that would be a huge step backwards. Yeah, yeah, it could be. So yeah. I think as, as we sort of touched on earlier, it could be possible, so like, you know, with Eckhart 13 speed, that has gone more narrow internally. And I, and I just don't know. I haven't had a chance to control test. So we do, as apart from the lubricant testing, um, I do when I can do wear longevity testing on yeah. the chains as well. So uh, I haven't wear longevity tested an Eckhart chain uh, yet, which so I need to try to get to that. And unfortunately, the customer uh, or just general sort of cyclist base on Eckhart, um, we don't have enough information back to sort of know their longevity. But I would expect it's probably gone back uh, yeah. a bit versus 12 speed because I don't think that they've introduced any new wear longevity tech, uh, long, sorry, longevity tech on their Eckhart that they have over, say, super record 12 speed. Yeah. So if the surface load areas are smaller, it will trend backwards. More investigation required, maybe. More investigation. So, but if more brands go that way and they do have to get thinner internally, yeah, unless they do take a step up again, it, we could see a trend back. But I, I don't know if there's much of a call to go. Hopefully not. No, I, I think 12 is good. So, We're only just yeah. starting to get to grips with 12 speed. Yeah. We don't want extra standards no, again. No, so I, I think it will probably stay around this mark for a bit and... Uh, yeah, I think for some brands, though, I'd like to see some brands that I guess are a little bit known for not having the fastest chains, perhaps bring out a time trial version, things like that. I'd like yeah. to see some some more stuff come out for, you know, especially the Avid races, all those that just like to have the... Like niche the applications. Yeah, more somewhere. niche applications. So because some of the chains aren't as quick as they probably should be and you sometimes don't have a choice really other than to run that chain for the system. Yeah. So bringing out a time trial version that's a couple of watts quicker, you know, so if it's two watts per 250 watt load, which is the general sort of test load, that that gap will pretty much double every sort of 250 watts. So it's not exactly linear, but it's pretty close. So if there's a, say, a two watt gap at 250 watt load, it'll be nearly four watts at 500 watt load okay. and so on. So once you start getting into some... Filippo you know, Garnet territory. Absolutely. Or even just good avid races that can smack down 800 watts on a, on a power climb for a minute to try to break away, there can be you know, a significant number of what's difference between, you know, this and, and that. So, yeah, coming out with some stuff like that for some brands I think will be good as well. But, oh, no, that's really good. Well, yeah. Adam, that's been amazing. Thanks so much for your time. Really oh, appreciate it. Thank you very much. No, thanks Enjoyed. so much. I hope everyone at home has found this um, interesting and informative. If you have, do let us know in the comments section down below. Um, give this video a thumbs up. And also, if you want to see more cool bike tech related videos, well, Subscribe to GCN Tech and turn on your notifications. Well, once again, Adam, thanks very much. Thanks, Alex. Cheers, man. Cheers. Right, bye.